Welcome. It's great to see so many people here. I'm Elizabeth Graver. I'm a member of the English Department at Boston College, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Ann Patchett here tonight to this event. The event is co-sponsored by Fiction Days and the Lowell Humanity Series, and we will have the great treat of hearing Ann read from her novel in progress titled Run, set in Boston. Um, and after her reading, we'll take a short break for anybody who needs to leave at that point, and then Anne would be happy to answer some questions, and after that, there will be books for sale in the rotunda, and she'd be happy to sign them. Yeah. Anne Patchett attended Sarah Lawrence College, where she took writing classes with Alan Gerganis, Russell Banks, and Grace Paley. While an undergraduate, she sold her first story to the Paris Review. She then went on to attend the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop, and in 1990, she won a residential fellowship at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. There she wrote her first novel, The Patron Saint of Liars. It was followed by three other novels, Taft, which won the Janet Heidinger Kafka Prize, The Magician's Assistant, and Bel Canto, which won the Penn Faulkner Award and the Orange Prize, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's also the author of a memoir, titled Truth and Beauty, about her friendship with the writer Lucy Greeley, and she lives in Nashville, Tennessee. <coughs> Excuse me. I recently came across a quote from an interview with Anne that took place soon after the publication of Bel Canto. The interviewer, commenting on the fact that Bel Canto is set in a mansion taken over by terrorists in an unnamed South American country, asks, was the confinement helpful to be able to define the stage so precisely and Anne answered, yes, but it's not so different from my other books in an odd way. In The Patron Saint of Liars, you're stuck in a home for unwed mothers. In Taft, you're stuck in a bar. In The Magician's Assistant, you're stuck in a tract house in Nebraska in the snow. Now, in this one, you're totally enclosed. Nobody gets out. Anne's writing does indeed map tight spaces but for me, the central power of her work lies in her ability to explore these claustrophobic spaces so steadily, so gently and thoroughly, and from so many different angles, that she ends up working as a kind of shapeshifter, allowing the tightest corners to open up into expansive terrain. In Bel Canto, which I'm sure many of you have read, this means that the mansion and its grounds become a kind of dreamscape expanding through the minds and hearts of the characters until the borders we're most interested in are not physical, but rather psychological, interpersonal, porous. They push out against all odds, against the edges of the box. In all of Anne's novels, the tight spaces expand in part through the rich variety of perspectives she's both willing and able to imagine. A pregnant married woman posing as unwed, an African-American male jazz singer, a female Jewish magician's assistant, Sabine, who lives alone with a rabbit named Rabbit and talks to her dead gay husband's dead lover, if you can figure that out, in her dreams. What is most striking to me about these characters is how, while the circumstances of their lives may hem them in, they are themselves not easily defined. I think here of Sabine and the magician's assistant, how we can, on the one hand, say of her, she's a wife, she's straight, she's a magician's assistant, and how at the same time, and in increasingly intricate and moving ways, Sabine's character plays with the boundaries of what it means to be straight or gay or married, of what it means to make a family, to live in the present or the past, of what it means to do magic even, until the book itself becomes a kind of magic act, a string of handkerchiefs streaming, at once real and mysterious from a hat. I think too of the layered portrait of friendship in truth and beauty, Lucy Greeley in Anne's arms like a happy bride, or Lucy as a grasshopper and Anne as an aunt. And then along comes a new moment, a different perspective, and the roles shift. People are impossible to contain. In a wonderful letter from Lucy included in the book, Lucy Greeley writes to Anne, quote, I can find no suitable words of affection for you, words that will contain the whole of your wonderfulness to me. You will have to make do with being my favorite bagel, my favorite blue awning above some great little cafe where the coffee is strong but milky and has real texture to it. Anyone who has read Truth and Beauty <clears throat> knows that in addition to having great gifts as a writer, Ann Patchett has great gifts as a friend, and also that she works very hard at both things with a sense of avocation that links friendship to art and art to friendship. 
There's a rare generosity to her work, and there's also, as you'll see tonight, a rare generosity to her person. Please help me welcome Ann Patchett. Hello. Um, I have this joke that I make a lot because it seems for reasons I cannot imagine that I often find myself giving readings in Protestant churches. <laughs> and I always make this joke when I take the altar to give a reading that all the nuns that taught me for 12 years are now spinning. And I'm thinking, this is good. I don't have to make that joke tonight. And I was like, <laughs> Finally, they're all going, yes, yes, you've made it, you've arrived, the mothership. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here at Boston College. And I am going to read the first chapter of my novel that I have been working on for what seems to be my entire life. I have been writing this book for so many years. I, I started this book probably about three and a half years ago. I started it right before Lucy died. And I had about 50 pages of it. And then when she died, I wrote Truth and Beauty right away and, and got very caught up in that whole giant saga. I'm going to feel so bad if that's my cell phone. Um, <laughs> but if it's not, you can feel bad that it's yours. Um, and then I went back to the book and discovered that everything that I was writing was horrible. And I threw it away. And I started again. The ideas still seemed good. And I did that for a while. and. And then I ended up ghostwriting a book for a friend, and, and I went back. And then I ended up doing Best American Short Stories 2006, which is fabulous. And I just finished that. And that will be out in October. I had such a good time. I'm so proud of that project. But this book keeps getting put on the back burner. And I keep coming back to it. And it's actually been really wonderful to live with something for such a long time. I believe in these people so absolutely. They are an incredible part of my life. And so I'm hoping that I'm about halfway through and that I will actually finish it by the end of the summer. But you know, God only knows what, what is between me and the end of this book. So this is the first chapter, which would mean it would need no setup at all. Uh, this chapter has almost nothing to do with what the book is about. Uh, <laughs> The book, like all of my books, as Elizabeth pointed out, is very myopic. It happens in about the space of three days in Boston during a snowstorm. And this has a, a fabulously huge cinematic opening. And we sweep through the first chapter, the giant panorama of the first chapter, into the claustrophobia of the little novel. I'm going to. I'm going to just make some adjustments here so I can actually see the page. OK, that's a little better. You can still hear me, yes. Um, the only thing that I would recommend is if you're going to drift and not pay attention, that's fine. I respect that. I've been to a lot of readings myself. Don't drift on the first page, because the only, the only thing that's confusing or hard to follow is the first page, where everybody gets dumped in. After that, piece of cake. All right, here we go. In the bedroom that Tip and Teddy shared all their lives until Tip went away to college, there was a statue of the Virgin Mary on the dresser. This is not only my Boston novel, it's my Catholic Boston novel. <laughs> um, before it was theirs, it had belonged to their mother, Bernadette. And in her family history, the statue held a position of such secular and sacred importance that after Bernadette's death, Two of her sisters asked Doyle if he would give it back to them. He declined, saying that the Virgin now belonged to Bernadette's sons and that they were as entitled to their legacy as any other Sullivan cousin. These two women, these aunts, had supported their now dead sister in her limitless quest for children, but they knew that Doyle did not mean to give the only family heirloom to his oldest son. He meant for the statue to go to the other ones, the little boys, as everyone called them. And really, why should two sons, two black adopted sons, own the statue that was meant to be passed down from redheaded mother to redheaded daughter? 
If Bernadette's uncle, Father John Sullivan, hadn't come down firmly on Doyle's side, chastising his nieces for even suggesting that Teddy and Tip should be forced to give up this likeness of their mother, having just given up Bernadette herself, chances are that none of the Sullivans would have ever spoken to any of the Doyles again. That's the only part in the book that's hard. <laughs> it was a very pretty statue as those things go, maybe a foot and a half high, carved from rosewood and painted with such a delicate hand that many generations later, her cheeks still bore the high, translucent flush of a girl startled by a compliment. The Virgin's eyes did not look up to heaven, but were cast down to the lowly creatures of the ground in a state of perpetual benevolence. She held her arms open wide to encircle any soul that would be coming towards her while her pale and slender feet balanced firmly on the round orb of earth. There was a serpent crossing that earth and she crushed it beneath her toes, saving mankind for all eternity in that one simple gesture. Likenesses of the Mother of God abound in the world, and in Boston they were doubled. But everyone who saw this statue agreed that it possessed a certain inestimable loveliness that set it apart. It was more than just the attention to detail, the tiny stars carved around the base that Earth sat on, the gentle drape of her cloak. It was Mary's youth, how she hovered on the line between mother and child herself. She wore nothing on her head but a simple, radiant halo, a thin wooden disc the size of a silver dollar and leafed in gold. It did little to compete with what was clearly her crown and glory, the thick red hair falling loose across her shoulders, dark as iron's rust. It was the combination of that red hair and the pale skin and the long, straight nose pointing down towards earth that made the Virgin resemble for all the world one Bernadette Sullivan Doyle. As she had resembled not her mother nor her grandmother, but Bernadette's great-grandmother before her. In the eyes of whoever had chosen the white of the skin and the red of her hair, this particular mother of God had been an Irish girl. The legacy of the statue, along with the statue itself, had passed down a maternal line for generations until they both became the property of Bernadette. It was a good story, and a long one, and so she had different versions for different occasions. There was the one that she told to Doyle when they were first married about a persistent and complicated seduction. Another one she told to her young sons is a bedtime story that had important lessons about the repercussions of lies. The third version was the most greatly varied. It was brought out for visitors who happened to remark on the beauty of the statue. This was back before they had children when the Virgin dominated the living room from the mantelpiece. Sometimes Bernadette would turn her eyes in the direction everyone was looking in as if she had never really noticed it herself. Oh that, she would say, that belonged to my grandparents back in Ireland. Other times, depending on her mood or how she felt about the person who had asked, she would tuck her long legs beneath herself like a nesting bird and lean forward in the chair. She would start at the beginning. Bernadette Doyle's great-grandfather was a passionate boy full of big stories and high expectations. When he was still very young, he set those expectations on the lovely shoulders of Doreen Clark, a red-headed girl, whose beauty was outmatched only by her piety. Doreen Clark had made it clear that she had no interest in any of the boys who took such a strong interest in her. She was leaning towards the convent as if a wind was blowing her there. No boy who tried had been able to distract her from her prayers and her good deeds, so despite all his best efforts, the great-grandfather's courting was met with no success. Despondent. The boy of 16, with a restless penchant for immediate gratification, left his hometown in Esky and was gone for half a year. If Doreen Clark had any feelings about his absence, she didn't mention them once, not even to her sisters. Doyle could tell that his wife was settling in for the long version, and so he went out to the kitchen to get another bottle of wine for the guests. He could still hear her voice from the other room, 
was not a particularly loud voice, but it had a remarkable ability to travel. It stayed with him no matter where he was in the house. Sometimes he could be as far away as the courthouse and he felt he could still hear the muffled sounds of Bernadette in his ears. It was a beautiful, inexplicable call, an ocean in a shell. When my great-grandfather came home, he was probably 17, Bernadette said. He looked leaner, handsomer than anyone had remembered, and he had a lumpy bundle tied to his back. He said he had traveled all over the world trying to put Doreen out of his mind, but the case was hopeless. No one could forget Doreen. And when he was in Rome, he went to Rome, I guess said, at 16, what year is this? Listen to the story another guest said, and Doreen tilted her head slightly towards that second guest in a nod of approval. The great-grandfather was quick to point out that he had traveled all the way to Rome, and sometimes he implied that he had gone even farther. He met a sculptor there whose job it was to carve saints out of very exotic woods for the pleasure of the Pope. On one especially golden Roman afternoon, the great-grandfather, sick of his own loneliness, sat down beside the sculptor who was turning a block of rosewood into St. Francis of Assisi while sitting on a park bench. He told this man, a complete stranger, the story of Doreen's beauty. There was pleasure in hearing himself say the words. No mention was made of there being any sort of language barrier between them. It was only said that the sculptor was so moved by the description he heard, her slender neck, her delicate ears, the red wings of her eyebrows, that he set St. Francis temporarily aside in order to carve a likeness of Doreen Clark. He had meant it to be a consolation for his new friend, but the more he worked, the more he felt the presence of the Blessed Virgin beneath his fingers, until finally there was nothing he could do but add a halo to the back of her head and put the planet Earth beneath her feet. The great-grandfather had no money to pay for the statue. The suitors are always poor, Bernadette said, and she smiled at Doyle, who had not been poor at all. But the sculptor insisted he take it on the one condition that it be presented to the young woman back home in Ireland as a gift. It was clearly implied that the sculptor himself had fallen more than a little bit in love with the likeness he had made. To win the heart of a beautiful girl, have her represented in art as someone of even greater beauty. To win the heart of a pious girl, have her be the model for Mary, Queen of the Angels. Not a chip of paint was knocked from her long blue cloak. Not a single fingertip on her graceful hands were missing. The statue possessed a kind of perfect beauty that poor children in Ireland had never been acquainted with, not even in church. And so this girl, who was scarcely 16 herself, was moved beyond words. Once it was in her hands, it was heavier than she had expected, about the weight of a sturdy mouse and cat. It left her breathless to see her face reflected in the face of the Mother of God. She had been good her whole life without any thought of earthly rewards, and yet clearly a reward had come to her. She could reach out her finger and touch it. She was Narcissus for the first time, seeing her own beautiful face reflected in the water of the stream. Standing at the front door of the bakery in the center of town where the great-grandfather had begged her to meet him for just three minutes, Doreen Clark fell in love with the statue. And while he told her his story, he batted away a bumblebee with his open palm as it tried to menace Doreen Clark, drawn as they all were to the vague lemon scent of her hair. Soon thereafter, they were married. The three of them, boy, girl, and virgin, set themselves up on the top floor of her parents' humble house and promptly had five children. Every morning, the girl, who is now a mother and a wife, knelt to say a prayer to her own likeness, and she was happy. The boy, who was quite grown into a man by now, had won the only thing he had ever wanted in his life, and so he was happy as well. People came by their little apartment on the pretense of visiting or borrowing a few cigarettes or admiring a new baby, but really, it was just that they never got tired of seeing Mother Mary as Doreen, 
women could not keep from crossing themselves and saying clearly it was a gift from God and that its beauty was exactly like hers, although the ones who were terribly jealous added the phrase, had been, exactly like her beauty had been. <laughs> Bernadette smiled. That's what you'll say when I'm old, she said to her husband. Look at that statue over there. That's what Bernadette used to look like. And Doyle leaned over and he kissed the part of his wife's hair and he said, you will never be old. No one implied that Doreen and her husband had a perfect life. They were terribly poor, everyone was poor. They had too many children, including a daughter with one leg that was shorter than the other, whose thump, thump, thump coming up the stairwell was the sound that broke her mother's heart every day. He drank too much, the great-grandfather, but so did half the island. These were still lean years, a scant generation after the Great Famine, and our couple would have had no more nor less than anyone else they knew but for the statue, which was not only a beautiful object, it was proof of their love. Love between hard scrabble young married people with five children was a thing in short supply, and so in that sense, they were better off than all the other hard-working men and their once beautiful wives. No one eats love, Doyle said. It was summer, and the last light of day slanted low and gold through the open windows. My point is that no one ate much of anything, Bernadette said, and cut a little piece of brie off to put on a slice of pear. I'm not saying they were starving, but these were hard times. Doesn't love soften hard times? I'd like to think so said a beautiful woman, a neighbor of theirs, who was perched alone on an ottoman near an empty fireplace. But this is where the story changes, Doyle said. Bernadette nodded and began again. Then one day, something turned inside the Bay of Esky. Suddenly, the sea could not do enough for my great-grandfather. Every fish within 20 miles swam into his net. The more fish he pulled out, the more people there were lining up to buy them. He made three times as much money that day as he had ever made, and that led to three times as much drinking and the generous buying of drinks for his neighbors, and soon the men were talking about the statue of the Virgin. Doreen raised her hand and made a small gesture to the woman on the mantelpiece so no one would lose sight of the fact that they were one in the same. The men were making some mildly scandalous toast to her beauty and the beauty of his wife and my great-grandfather's adventuresome youth. A man called Kilkelly, who was as drunk as the rest of them, leaned himself across the bar with the drink that his friend had paid for in his hand, and he said, tell the truth for once now. You stole it, didn't you? You just went into a church somewhere and you stole that thing right off the altar. Kill Kelly would later say that in his life he had never had that thought and that he didn't actually think it was true. The comment was born in the spirit of joking, the sort of cruelty that one has towards a fortunate man, but he did say it. And in that moment of merriment and slamming down of glasses and on bars and drinking to a sea full of fish, the great grandfather heard him and the words went through his heart like a spear through the side of Christ. The truth. It happened on a night when he was 16 years old and away from Askey. He was as drunk that night as he had ever been and still been standing. And in some town he never bothered to ask the name of, swaying through the streets in a cold fog, his bare head damp from the air. He was looking for a dry place to sleep it off, and praise God, the side door to the church was open, a lucky oversight because those priests locked things up tight from drunks like him. He was a lucky man. He was a lucky boy, to be exact. All of the votive candles had been snuffed out for the night to be thrifty, but he felt his way along the pew and found a cushion to put his head on and went to sleep right there in the first row. And when he woke up, the light was pouring in blue and gold through the windows, 
spreading out across the polished floors and the pews and the worn cloth of his own muddy trousers. And who did he see in that light but Doreen Clark? the beautiful dream of his youth, right there on the altar, smiling down at him. He blinked his eyes open again and again, and he felt the warmth and certain light of love pouring into his open heart. Doreen Clark was with him. Doreen Clark would love him. He knew it like the Stations of the Cross. It wasn't just a sign, it was an atlas. Those were her eyes, those were her little hands. Those were her glorious iron rust locks that he had longed to touch every Sunday he had sat behind her in mass since he was a child. This could only mean that God had called on him to go home and win her back. He had to straighten up his ways. And the best thing to do would be to go to Esky, collect Doreen Clark, and bring her here to see the statue that pointed him so clearly to her. But then he closed his eyes and he tried to think. She would never travel to another town in his company if she hadn't even been willing to go with him for a piece of penny candy at the pharmacy. The mountain would go to Mohammed. He would borrow the statue for a week that it took to walk it home and walk it straight back. Surely, God made allowances for borrowing in certain severe situations. He took off his jacket and wrapped it gently around the virgin mother who he was already coming to think of as his little Doreen, and he left the church by the same door through which he had entered. It was unnervingly simple, and no one saw him. No one cried out, thief! Mile after mile, he looked over his shoulder, waiting to see the hordes of angry Catholics chasing him down for kidnapping, but none of them came. The farther away he got with his pleasant weight, the more he knew the statue was never coming back. He had the entire long walk home to imagine different scenarios of what might have happened. Once, he came upon an abandoned church in a town where every last person had died of a fever, and so he picked the virgin up and carried her away. And once the church had burned to the ground and he found her in the embers, unsinged, smoldering smoke around him, her arms raised up. He thought of winning her in a game of dice with a priest or receiving it as a gift of performing some act of heroism as yet unimagined, but then he worried that a better man might show benevolence and decline what was offered. As he scrolled through the endless possibilities he lost his way to Esky several times. He would ask for directions, but inevitably wander down the wrong road and then double back again. He'd stop and ask someone a left at the white oaks and then follow the creek downstream. But his head was too full of stories to gather his bearings. On the third day, he decided it would be better if the statue had come from someplace very far away, someplace deeply holy that would sit beyond all suspicions like Rome. And then he had the statue made for her, and it wasn't a coincidental liking, likeness, it was a tribute of his own design. And that was when he began to see himself as a great man coming home in glory. As ridiculous as his story was, no one ever doubted it. His proof was in the irrefutable likeness of Doreen Clark in her marvelous hair. His proof was in the fact that when he finally found his way home and told her the story, that she had agreed to marry him. Every man in the bar saw the truth plainly now, and the terrible crumple and blanch of a lie come undone. The great-grandfather, who was then only 25, turned his back on the crowd and fell on his drink in silence. By the time he had finished, settled the bill and walked home, the news of his crime had swept across the valley like a soaking rain. All of the riches the fish had supplied had been consumed by himself and his kind, and he had been exposed as a fraud. By the time he walked through the door of his own house, there wasn't a single detail of the evening that his wife hadn't heard. And there the story ends. The guests leaned forward 
It was dark now, and they had forgotten all about dinner. They wanted to know what came next, but there was nothing left that Bernadette wanted to tell. It was the point at which she would sigh and shake her head, oh, enough of that, I have been going on forever. Who wants another drink? What about the wife, the guests would say. The wife, she shrugged. She wasn't happy about it. So they would wait, thinking that this was part of the drama. Many years later, her sons would wait for her to go on as well, but that was actually as far as she was willing to go. She only told the ending that she knew to Doyle. Sadness, without any sort of redemption, doesn't make for good storytelling. And every time she started out, she seemed to forget that there was no fit place to end. Once again, she had been caught unprepared. Doreen Clark, now Mrs. Doreen Lovell, came to see in one night that her happiness, her marriage, and her children had all been based on thievery and willful deception. The Catholic Church had been robbed, and so had she, but there could be no extrication for her now, no returning to her youthful dreams of convent life. She was waist deep in wet cement. She lifted the statue of her own likeness into her arms, touched the cheek that had once been her cheek. She felt the rest of her days stretching out before her like a gaping hole. How she would miss the companionship, the prayers. There was no imagining how empty the apartment would be now. She bagged it gently in one of the wedding pillowcases her mother had tatted with lace, a case she had wrapped in tissue paper and stored in the chest at the foot of her bed without ever once putting her head on it. Then she sent the great-grandfather out of the house and into the horrible darkness. Take it back, was all she said. Of course, he couldn't take it back any more than he could take back a leaf in a cluttered autumn forest to the rightful tree from which it fell, Ireland was crowded with pubs and crowded with churches, and all he knew for sure was that one night, eight years ago, he had stumbled out of one of them and into the other one. He didn't know which saint the church had been named for, Francis or Anne, Michael, Lucy. It could have been the Sacred Heart of Jesus or Our Lady of Laredo. It could have stood for fishermen or farmers. He could have walked to every one of them, knocking door to door. Have I stolen this from you? And so he walked to no place in particular. He thought about his sins, and he thought about his intentions, and one of them was quite bad, but the other one was really fine. He carried the virgin in his arms like a child, and from time to time he would pull back the pillowcase from her beautiful face and weep for his love of his wife. And then he would go home. That was more or less the way it went for the rest of their lives. She turned him out, and he came back again. Every time he walked down his own street, his children would rush to meet him, their dirty little hands stretching up towards his neck. Da, did you bring her home? They'd cry, and his wife would let him stay two days or two months, sometimes two years, until she couldn't stand it anymore, living with the burden of their sins. But she was like the children, too. Her heart always stuttered with joy and relief to see the bulky shape inside the pillowcase as the great-grandfather started back up the stairs. She would lift the statue from his arms and carry Mary, Mother of God, to her dresser, studying the face that had been her face, the beautiful, youthful face that was gone. Had that ever been the color of her hair? And then she would cross herself and say a prayer. People might think that Doreen Lovell should have given this statue back to the parish or at the very least willed it to them when she died, but she made it clear that the rightful home could not be found, that it was to stay in her family. The Virgin had made Doreen's family, after all. She was the reason for their existence, and so they were bound to one another. When Doreen was 68 and tired of life, she gave the statue to her daughter, Loretta, Loretta looked the most like her mother, the undisputed beauty of the family, despite her mismatched legs. She wore her heavy red hair loose down her back to compensate for the small inequity of femur. 
The other children in the family, even the boys, could never forgive their sister for winning the prize, even though they had previously loved her best and protected her from bullying children who mocked her in the streets by dragging one leg behind. When her parents were dead and it seemed clear there would never be anything even approaching a better life in Esky, Loretta packed up the statue of Mary and took it with her on the boat to Boston with her husband and her children. It was there that she would one day give it to her daughter Cecilia, the only redhead in a pack of seven blondes that included one John Sullivan, who would one day make her the proudest by becoming a priest. Celia grew up to be much more generous than anyone ever imagined. She gave the statue to her own daughter, Bernadette, on her wedding day, much to the anguish of Bernadette's two dark-haired sisters. Even her four brothers felt the loss as though they knew they never had a chance. There was no way around the unfairness, one beautiful thing that could never be divided among so many children. But anyone who saw it said immediately that was a statue of Bernadette with a halo stuck on the back of her head. It's kind of creepy, her teenage friends would whisper whenever they came over to the house. This was the chorus that was sung behind her growing up, Bernadette is the lucky one. And so she couldn't help but feel that she was. She had the statue, after all, the image of herself and her mother and her mother's mother all the way back to Ireland. How many hours had she laid on her stomach, staring at those blue robes as a child, touching her finger ever so lightly to the sharp edge of the halo? When she and Doyle bought the four-story that they couldn't afford on the wrong end of Tremont, she put Mother Mary on the mantel over the fireplace. Back then, there was only one sofa, a dinged-up chair, a little round leather ottoman that reminded her of a button. In that bright, empty room, there was no place else to rest her eyes. The Virgin looked so much larger and holier than she had in the clutter of the parents' house. Don't you think it's a kind of overtly Catholic, her young husband asked. Bernadette cocked her head to one side and tried to divorce herself from history. She tried to see it as something new. It's art, she said. It's me. Pretend that she's naked. <laughs> Once she was married, Bernadette didn't pray to the statue the way she had as a girl, though sometimes she prayed to a vague idea of God, more out of respect to her uncle Sullivan than anything else. If he thought there was something to faith, then there was something to faith. After their son Sullivan was born, there was more to pray for, that he would stay healthy, that he would be safe. She did not pray for Doyle to be elected vice mayor, though sometimes she prayed unconsciously for the speeches and the fundraising dinners to come to an end. She did not understand her husband's love of politics, but she prayed for him to have what he wanted because she loved him. She prayed for what she wanted as well the day that she would have her own red-headed daughter to pass the statue on to, and then she simply prayed for another child. And then she prayed for her pregnancy to hold to term, and then she prayed to have another shot at pregnancy, and another and another, but the praying didn't get her anywhere. She prayed for the strength and the wisdom to be satisfied by everything she had, a beautiful husband, a, a beautiful son, a loving husband. She accepted to pray, she prayed to accept God's will. She prayed to stop praying, a pastime that never made her feel anything but selfish and childish, but she could not stop. Then Sullivan was 12 years old, independent and wild, and Doyle was the mayor. They had spent two years on the adoption wait list, standing in line, just like everybody else, she did not ask for anything as ridiculous as a girl or a redhead, a baby. Any baby would be fine. Bernadette's religion was the large and boisterous family she had come from, and she believed in them deeply. She had meant to put two beds in every room in the house. She believed that Sullivan needed siblings as badly as she needed more children to love. She waited, and she looked at that statue, and she prayed. Happiness compresses time, makes it dense and bright, pocket size. Of those four good years between Teddy's arrival and Bernadette's death, 
Doyle can somehow only assemble two weeks of memory. Teddy coming to them when he was six days old and then the agency calling back two weeks later to say that the mother had changed her mind, not that she wanted the baby back, but that she had decided her two sons should stay together and would they consider taking, in addition, a good boy, 14 months old. It was exactly the windfall that Bernadette had dreamed of, something too good to pray for. Did Doyle want another child? Did he want two? By the time they arrived, he could no longer remember. There had been a time early in the marriage when he had wanted to fill up the house as much as Bernadette, but in those years the children failed to materialize, he'd ceased to want them for their own sake. In those years, all he wanted for his wife to be happy. So when the little boys arrived, he did not think, finally, I have the children that I want. He thought, now Bernadette is happy. Seeing Bernadette happy after so many disappointments was Doyle's truest desire. And this is how he came to love the boys themselves. He loved them for making Bernadette happy. For four short years, the house was full. The virgin moved into the little boys' rooms and watched them from the dresser while they slept. It was in January, after the extravagant rush of Christmas, that Teddy got a cold. And there was nothing unusual about that. Teddy always caught things first. Then Tip's cold leapt to strep throat, and Sullivan started to cough. Sullivan got the strep, and then it went to Doyle, and they passed it around like that, one to the other, back and forth, with Bernadette doling out antibiotics and taking temperatures and running herself down further and further down as she climbed the stairs with popsicles and bright, shimmering bowls of jello. In taking the children to the doctor, she never went to the doctor herself. It was a pediatrician who touched her neck who reached up from Tip, who was sitting patiently on the table, turning the pages of a picture book, and he put his hand on Bernadette's neck without asking her first. Do you feel this, he said, touching the lump that was there. And that's chapter one. And the next time we see these people, it's Tip and Teddy are 21 and 22. And Sullivan is 36 and just come back to Boston from Africa, where he's been living. Um, so that's that. Thank you. I am. Um, I actually really don't like reading from work that I'm working on, and I don't particularly believe in it, but reading from Truth and Beauty hasn't worked, and it's not in this, some emotional thing, but it just doesn't, it doesn't read well. And, um, and I would rather kill myself from, than read from Bel Canto again. <laughs> so that leaves this. You know, sometimes I want to show up at one of these things and be like, I'm reading from Patron Saint. You know, I read it, I wrote it when I was 26, but tonight, I haven't read it since I was 26, but tonight's the night. We're all going to go back there together. Um, so anyway, that's why I'm reading this, and, and God knows, by the time I'm finished with it, I'll be sick of it, too. So if there, oh, now this is when you get to leave. <laughs> Gracefully, with no shame, I'll turn my back. Um, and if you don't, and you can leave at any point, and you won't hurt my feelings. Although you would have hurt my feelings desperately had you streamed out like rats from a sinking ship while I was right in the middle of that. So thank you. And if there are any questions, no matter what they are, nor how personal, I'll happily answer them. I'm just that kind of girl. And if there, kind of, you know, there is a question, you just don't want to ask me first. You know, leave me up here twisting in the wind. Yes. Uh, the question is, how large was the statue? How do I envision it? I, I actually say it's a foot and a half high. You know that statue. You've seen it a million times. It's, yeah. It's, it's what? It had to fit in a pillow? Yeah, sure, but that would fit in a pillowcase, foot and a half. Maybe your head was peeking out the top or she was at an angle or something like that. Ah, the logistics of statuary.
Yes? I have about a, uh, oh no, I, the question is how far am I and does it have a release date? Um, my great genius is that I don't actually sell my books before I'm finished writing them. So it doesn't make any difference when I finish it. And I thought I was going to finish it about three years ago, so, you know, who knows. I think I'm going to finish it by the end of the summer. I thought that last summer, you know, I, I, <laughs> I have no idea. Yes? Oh, no. She, she finds it interesting that writers have a hard time getting down to writing. That's, that's the least interesting thing about writers. That's, that's why we're so much fun. That's why we'll always go out to lunch. We'll go to a matinee. You want to see a bad movie at 2 in the afternoon? Call a novelist. And they're always like, yeah, I really want to see that new Sarah Jessica Parker movie. Yeah. Uh, and off we go. We have a hard time. Because especially if you're not on deadline. Sometimes I actually think about selling the book because I know that if I sold the book, I would finish it. And I'm so deadline driven. But uh, on the other hand, if a refrigerator falls on my head and I can't finish it and I owe somebody money, I, it makes me very uncomfortable. So, yeah. Yes. The question is a sense of magic in all of my books, which I think does exist and I think has a lot to do with Catholicism and spending 12 years in a religion that gave us voodoo, you know, that, that spawned biting live heads off chickens. You know, you know it, it's, um, it, it's, it's not a symbol in Catholicism, you know? It's the real deal, and, and you grow up with that, and you grow up thinking, well, this is possible. Here, here are the saints and the, the miracles. I'm choking, I'm not actually moved or anything. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I lose my voice in mid-sentence, and I think people must think I'm just, <gasps> the saints, the miracles. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that magic has always been a, an interesting and fully integrated part of my life. And I don't think I write magic realism, which every now and then people say that I do. But I, I think that Garcia Marquez doesn't think that he writes magic realism either. I mean, from what I understand, he really believes that the, that girl went up with the sheets that day. and. Everybody was there, saw it, and you know, and that's sort of how I feel. Um, do I compare myself to Al Would I compare myself to Alice Hoffman? No, I would not. There you go. I just couldn't go there at all. Okay. <laughs> yes. I, I'm really, really glad that you asked me that question that I would be willing to share with you what I'm reading right now. I said to my mother when I left, someone's gonna ask me what I'm reading. <laughs> and boy, are they gonna get an earful. <laughs> okay, several months, well for one thing, what have I just been reading? I've been reading short stories for six months, for Best American Story. And so I've really been excited, what am I gonna read? I just went to Russia, I read a bunch of books, I read, I read Dickens, I read Hard Times, I, I read a bunch of things I had to blurb, and I read a ton of bad things, unbelievable. I had a book I had to review that was horrible, that was like somebody calling in a favor. Bah. Anyway, a lot of my reading life is that. But before I started with uh, The Best American Project, I read Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking, which was a book I loved and sent me back to rereading all of Didion's earlier books, which I also love, the nonfiction more than the fiction. Um, she was a big influence on me. But there was a line in the Year of Magical Thinking in which she says, 
that was the year that John stood in the pool all summer rereading Sophie's Choice, trying to figure out how he did it. So I thought, I never read Sophie's Choice. I'm going to read Sophie's Choice. Well, I get about 200 pages into Sophie's Choice, which is a little bit shorter than War and Peace. And I think this may be the best book I've ever read in my life. I, I mean, I, I can't believe it. I, I am over the moon. How could I have gone so long? This is definitely one of the top five reading experiences of my life. I buy the book for several friends who have not read it, and I send it to them. At which point, that book makes a U-turn, the likes of which I have <laughs> never encountered. I read Sophie. I took it all the way home to the end. That was one of the worst books I've ever read in my life. It was like a train that is going faster and faster, and he loses control, totally loses control, and the, it, it explodes. It's a despicable book. Um, but the, but, but beautiful. The first 200 pages, fantastic. He's brilliant. He's a wonderful writer. I don't know. If anybody wants to talk to me about Sophie's Choice afterwards, it was interesting. I called everyone I knew. I guess I had to talk about Sophie's Choice. And, and people either said, oh, yes, it's absolutely horrible, or they said, shut up, don't talk to me about it. I read it in high school. I loved that book. That was so important to me. Don't wreck it for me. I don't want to think about it again. That was a beautiful experience in my life. I don't want to talk about Sophie's Choice. So, um, but there were, I was talking, the one friend of mine who warned me off of it before I started said to me, if you ever go to somebody's house for dinner, if they ever invite you over, and while they're getting the appetizers and the drinks, you're perusing their bookshelves, and you see a copy of the Confessions of Nat Turner, leave the house. <laughs> leave the house in the friendship, go. And so um, I'm feeling so bitter about Styron. I really hurt one of my eyes while I was, it was the print was so tiny and it was so long. I'm go I, I got darkness visible, and that's what I'm going to read on the plane going home, because I want to see if it was perhaps Sophie's choice that got him so down. Um, did you ever expect to hear a professional rant? <laughs> it, it wouldn't, you know, the world is full of horrible books, and I've read most of them. <laughs> but to read a book that is so good by a writer that is so fabulous and so smart and is taking on so much and that you love it with your whole heart. I mean, it's a totally a different experience to go out on a lousy date than it is to love someone with the deepest essence of your being and then, you know, have them turn out to be themselves a Nazi war criminal. The, the disappointment is much larger. You take it to heart. So that was my experience. Books that I have liked recently. Um, I liked Veronica, Mary Gateskill, a lot. It is a book I could completely understand not liking. It is one of the, it's like a fever dream. And you either get into the fever dream or you don't. I did. I loved it. Uh, I loved the new Cormac McCarthy book, No Country for Old Men. Couldn't put it down. Just, you just ripping through the pages as fast as you can, which, as most of you know, is not the hallmark of a Cormac McCarthy novel. As good as they are, they're not what you call fire reads. On the Cormac McCarthy front, Sutri, the very best of them all. Um, I read The March. Did anybody read The March? I feel like I'm the only person I know who read it. Okay, but not a couple of you. Not a, not a lot of hands in the house. It was okay. I like it. Very well done. Super perfectly competent. Not emotionally engaging. Cold. Distant. Beautiful. Perfect. Okay. Read short stories. They're just so much better. Yes. Is my own craft enhanced by writers I admire? And if so, how? Yes, absolutely. There are certain writers that I admire enormously that I just think, oh, well, great. I could never do anything like that. Nabokov always comes to mind. Um, Mary Gateskill. 
perfect example. I, I could no more, I not only couldn't write like that, I couldn't even think like that, not even for a sentence. So there are people that I love who don't influence my work at all because it's so far away from what I'm capable of or how my mind works. There are other people who I really can learn from. I learn an enormous amount from John Updike. I learn an enormous amount from Philip Roth. Can I be specific? How does the question how it's not like that. It's not it's not like you look at a great dress and you think I'm going to go out and find that pattern and cut that skirt cuz that would work for me. It, it's you absorb everything and I think that the writer is the great compost pit and they just take it in and take it in and probably the stuff that I hate influences me every bit as much as the stuff that I love. What are you pushing towards? What are you pushing away from? The writer that I always think of though that really influenced the way I write my books is Raymond Chandler, who is a writer I adore. But Raymond Chandler's great piece of advice is when things get slow, bring in a guy with a gun. <laughs> and I really believe that. I want to be, I want to be the literary page turner. I want to be the person that you say, I started your book and I couldn't put it down. I love something that moves. I love a plot forward movement. And, and he was a great one for that. The two of you, right next to each other, yes. <laughs> Work it out amongst yourselves. The two of you, did you come together tonight? Okay, and they both want to know if I know my ending before I began, and the answer is yes. Because if I don't know where I'm going, I don't know how to get there. And I, I definitely put the whole story together in my head and then move towards that point. And things change, things change, but I know. Yes, now you can ask another question. The question is, there are literary kudos prizes that you win, and then there are commercial people going out and buying your book, and do I care about one more than the other? I definitely care about the prizes. And the reason is, I never believe that anybody reads my books. I believe that they buy them in enormous cartons, and they're building extra bathrooms or something <laughs> on the back of their house with them. Whenever somebody says, oh, I read your book, I'm like, you are kidding me, really? Um, I don't make that mental connection. And, and also, I crave invisibility as much as possible. So it's not my great goal that everybody in the world's gonna know who I am. And I'm, I write literary novels. I, I had fully planned to lead an entire life in rock bottom obscurity and die that way. And that just seemed like part of the deal to me. So, so that whole thing of the audience and the fans and the numbers is strange. The money, great. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the prizes, those are the kinds of things that I was moony-eyed about when I was a little girl. And I did dream, dream, dream that someday, you know, I would win an important prize. And, and then I would be serious, you know? I, I was somebody who just always wanted to be smart and smarter than I am and have people take me serious. And so that, that's take me serious, the. <laughs> Did you get that on film? <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Wasn't the opera planned for Bel Canto and is anything happening on that? I'll do this really fast. Yes, the opera was commissioned for the 2006 season of the Santa Fe Opera, but it fell through. At the last possible moment, you could buy tickets for that opera and it fell through and it was never written. The rights then were wrestled with a great deal of physicality back to me because Renee Fleming wanted to do it for the Met and Peter Gelb, if we've been reading our New York Times art sections, the new director of the Met, wanted to produce Bel Canto for Renee. 
but she was only interested in two composers, and neither one of them wanted to do it, and so that's off. Now, Bertolucci is supposedly making the movie. The script was due in October. We haven't heard anything about that yet. They say they're shooting this summer in Italy, but there isn't a script. Maybe they'll improvise. Now, the really big question, the huge looming question, oh, and Deborah Warner wanted to do a stage play, but I thought that might be a little bit much, although she seemed much smarter than anybody else I talked to. Okay. So now here's the question of whether or not I am going to sell myself out at a level that none of you can even imagine. Yes? What? Oh, no, no, I've already sold myself out to Hollywood. That's Bertolucci. See, you control all these different rights. There, I control the ballet rights to Bel Canto, okay? There are the opera rights, there are the movie rights, there are the stage play rights. I could technically sell the stage play, the opera, the movie, the finger puppet, the ballet. <laughs> so what's left? What are you missing on that list? Which one are you not thinking of? Yes, the Broadway musical rights. Because <laughs> yes, Andrew Lloyd Webber wants to make, yeah, yeah, no, right, no, don't do it. Turn back, no, no, <laughs> have a little dignity, okay? But think about this. <laughs> it's been three years, three years. He calls, we, we go back and forth, then he, then he leaves. Then he, the next year goes by, he calls, we go back and forth, and he, he, he's, he's, he's ambivalent, we're ambivalent, we're ambivalent about one another. He blames me for the Chechens. I can't even get into that. I'm not joking. He blames me for the Chechens. But I'll tell you what, this is the third year. And I said, I want to, you know, I want an offer. I want something on paper. I want to know. It looks like I can withhold both my name and the name of the book from the production. Do you have any idea? Do you have any, like, any idea? what kind of money we're talking about? If now, I mean, does the phrase now and forever mean anything to you people? I, I don't know. I'm, it is, it is been the deepest moral question of the last three years to the point where a couple of times I have gotten off the phone and thrown up. I was so utterly upset by the magnitude of this sellout. And then I think, you know, hell, life is short. And, and I could do a lot of good with that money. Is that what everybody says right before they start dealing drugs in the playground? <laughs> I'm going to take the money from this Oxycontin and I'm going to go help the blind or something. I don't know. Um, I, that, that's the continuing saga. But the moral of the story is until you buy a ticket and go to see it, never ever believe it is actually gonna happen. Take as much option money as you can, get it in the bank. Lucy Greeley used to always say that the chances that an option will become a movie that you actually see are statistically the same chances that a first kiss on a first date will become a 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> And that's really true. I mean, I've been through options, with all my books, options, 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 and everybody's going to do it. And, and you realize that the game, the best case scenario, is that they give you the money and then they drop you. Right? That's, that's actually what you're rooting for. <laughs> so, um, and that's gambling. And it's interesting. Yes? Hmm. The question, where was the last place I taught, which was UC Irvine in the graduate program about seven or eight years ago. I was there for 10 weeks. I am a guest teacher. I am an occasional person, and I don't teach. And I like to teach. It's really interesting. I got a call from Vanderbilt last week, and they were saying, what could we do to get you to come and teach? Because I live in Nashville, like right down the street. And I really thought, what would it take what could they possibly give me? Do I mean, do I want to swim in their pool? Do I want to? I, and I, I couldn't come up with one single thing. So no, I'm never going to teach again. Um, and, I, and I do like it, but teaching is like this. 
what you see now is, is what I'm like in the classroom. And when I leave here, I'm going to have a big drink and go to bed, which is what always happened when I taught, too. I mean, it just, it, I put a lot out. It takes a lot out. Your students never go away. They stay with you for all eternity. And, and I could make so much more money pouring myself out to Andrew Lloyd Webber. That <laughs> Why do I need to do that? You've been so patient over there. Yes. Um, she loves my characters in Bel Canto and how they mesh together and wants to know where I get my inspiration. That's based on a true story, which was the 1996 takeover of the uh, Japanese embassy in Lima, Peru. And that was it. You know, it, when I read that story in the paper, I thought, oh, look, it's a Patchett novel. It's a bunch of people confined. My whole life is a process of trying to plagiarize the Magic Mountain. I'm not joking. I just, I make feeble little jumps towards the Magic Mountain again and again and again. And if I could just write a book about a tuberculosis sanitarium, I would get it out of my system and that would be that. But when I saw that, I was like, look, happy hostages ordering pizza and playing kickball. I, this is a story for me. And I actually was not writing, but definitely researching, putting it together when it came to an end. And I was with uh, the writers, uh, Robert Ellen Butler and his wife, Elizabeth Dewberry, at their house. And Bob and I were out having lunch, and Betsy called and said, come home quick. It's, it's over, because I told them about the book. And I watched the end of my novel sitting on their bed. It was wild. Yes. I, well, the answer is yes and yes. The question is, is there always some spark of reality or do I imagine something? I, my standard answer is if you read science fiction, I can tell you that that Martian was the author's mother. There is no such thing as completely imagined work and I think my work comes awfully close. The people in my books are not people that I know. Um, the situations are not situations that I have lived through, but the emotional content is very true to my emotional content. And what these people care about and what they're wrestling with in their life is definitely what I'm wrestling with. But the facts are changed, which makes it interesting. And now one more question, and then Elizabeth would like to go home. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, not you, no. <laughs> I actually, I really appreciate it because I can, I do this and everybody's thinking, waiting for answers. I remember when I was at the Bunting sitting next to somebody at a talk that had gone on for years and there was a woman who I knew very well sitting next to me and she started to and I raise her hand and I leaned over and I said, if, if you put that arm up, I am taking it off. <laughs> <laughs> So you always want to wind up the evening before that happens. Now, you had a question. Yes? There was a photograph of the two of us on the back of the hardcover. That was not on set, and if there's a hardcover out there, you can see it. It was really funny because Lucy loved to have her picture taken, and she was very photogenic. And when uh, Autobiography of a Face came out, all the fashion magazines did huge photo spreads on her because it was, as Lucy always said, it was an interesting story because she was a pretty girl in those very classic American blue-eyed blonde sort of way that had lost her jaw. And therefore, people were much more interested in what her deformity was like. And so there were certainly a lot of pictures of Lucy. There were a lot of pictures of me. There was only a handful of pictures of the two of us together. Um, and really only one picture that was any good. And it was funny when... Um, when she died, that picture was in New York Magazine. I wrote first an essay for New York Magazine about her death right after she died that was on the cover. And her sister called me 
and it's a picture in which I'm holding Lucy in my arms, which I often was, which was not a big deal because I am very strong and Lucy was very small. And her sister called and she said, somewhere Lucy is looking down from heaven and she's saying, does my ass really look like that? <laughs> and and it's, it's really true. It, she, would have, she would have died all over again had she seen that picture. It was just the angle that I had her at was, it wasn't good. But there you go. You've been lovely. It's been fun. Come back. We'll do it again. Good night. <laughs>